I am confident that the time I'm going to spend now with my guest is going to heighten your consciousness, your valuing of just a minute. Wes Stafford, the author, is the president and CEO of Compassion International, a position he's held for 20 years. But Wes, you have been involved with this mission, ministry, for much longer. Well, longer than that, actually 34 years from the first day I walked into the place. And it hit me last year, that's, a, that's longer than Jesus walked on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> and just about everything. And had all the jobs you can have in the place. Someone said to me today, because it's Colorado Springs, where you're based, uh, that they're calling it New Jerusalem. So many ministries have moved there. There's over 150 ministries now there. We call it uh, the Evangelical Mecca. <laughs> <laughs> you have a doctorate in community development, uh, perfect fit for the kind of work that Compassion does. Yeah. But the call to this kind of work, uh, helping the poor, rescuing children, came to you in a very unexpected place and circumstance. I'd like you to tell the story. Well, I think that uh, I was Compassion's president in training from the time I was maybe being knit in my mama's womb, but certainly my earliest recollections, uh, which was a life in a little African in the Ivory Coast of West Africa. My folks were missionaries. My sister and I were the only white children for a day's drive in any direction. And uh, it was a very gentle-spirited village, although it was poverty-stricken. They had a saying, it takes the whole village to raise a child. And they, they lived like that. I was totally the wrong color. Uh, but they took me in like their son. They taught me what they taught their children about love and joy. and I mean, All of my values I learned from the poor. Mm. And they... Uh, they comforted me when I fell down. They scolded and, and uh, corrected me when I was uh, doing no-nos in the village. Such a community, isn't it? It was a complete community. My biggest problem was that I stood out. Uh, if I was in a pack of kids doing the wrong thing, they always knew that I was one of the culprits. And I used to pray every night, Lord, please, I need some camouflage here. <laughs> when I wake up in the morning, let my skin be black like all my friends. Really? Yeah, you can, you know, you brought down the walls of Jericho. I know you can do this. And that would be the I would check in the morning. I'd throw my sheet off. God. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. But right under this white skin, I'm, I'm thoroughly African, and I'm deeply in the debt uh, of the poor. My heart was shaped by it because uh, we were vulnerable. We, uh, many of my friends died. By the time I was 15 and came to the United States to live, half of my boyhood friends had died. Why? Many of them in my arms. Uh, because of poverty. They, didn't, they died of measles, malaria, starvation, uh, things that you shouldn't have to die from. But, uh, you know, our nearest hospital was a day away, and um, we were vulnerable. I cried myself to sleep over my little friends hundreds of nights as a little boy. Mm -hmm. And then I came to America, saw the food, saw the medicine, and realized... And that's it. I am going to serve as a bridge between people like my village and wonderful, caring people who uh, God has blessed who want to help but just don't know what to do and who to trust. So now I lead Compassion. What it does is it bridges these two worlds. You know, we've got a, over a million links between children and sponsors in the United States or Canada or across Europe. I'm right in the sweet spot of my calling. I understand that, well, I, I think you shared the number of children who've come from poor villages and in or through university yep. through the program. Yep. We have well over 2,500 who came through our leadership development program. Many more found their way through uh, university. Quite a challenge. You know, for every 10,000 children who start school in Haiti, one gets to university. It's an incredible pyramid. So these little children from the poorest to the poor, God wired them smart. We've given them every opportunity to reach their potential. I tell them, you may have been born in poverty, but poverty wasn't born in you. So climb high, but always be thankful and reach back. Pull someone else up with you. Now, Wes, this we could just wrap this up as a wonderful success story. Except that this heart of compassion that you're expressing, desire to, to help others, should have been crushed out of you because of your own childhood experience through the years in a boarding school while your parents were on the mission field? Yeah, I had two things. 
in my childhood that was breaking my heart on a, on a yearly basis. Uh, one was the loss of friends to poverty, and the other was being abused. It was mission policy in those days to send every missionary child across West Africa when they got to age six off a day, a, a week's truck drive to another country, uh, all of us uh, to be in a, a boarding school for nine months of each year away from our folks. Being away from your parents is hard. You're lonely. Uh, this started at the age of nine? Six. six. Age of six. From the time we went into first grade, that, that's where we were sent off. It was tough enough to be away from our parents, but the real horror of what was going on was that those who were in charge of us, the grown-ups, uh, didn't want to be doing it. You know, that's not what they went to Africa to do. Uh, they didn't make it linguistically or cross-culturally or something. And instead of being fired, we're simply given the least important job you can have, and that's just, well, go take care of the kids. I learned in my childhood that terrible things can happen uh, when children are considered unimportant. So up there, angry at the assignment, untrained to work with kids, not called to work with kids, didn't want to work with kids, angry about it all, uh, they took out their, uh, their anger on 50 of us little kids. And it was, a, it was a very harsh school. We now refer back to it as Auschwitz. Uh, abuse on every front was going on, spiritual abuse. Uh, I was scared to death of uh, their God. And I knew that I was a little sinner in the hands of that angry God because look at them, they're beating me all the time. Emotionally, we were deeply scarred. I never made eye contact with grown-ups growing up in that place because nothing good could come of an interchange with an adult. Physically, uh, we were beaten uh, regularly. There was a million reasons to get a, a beating. I mean, a simple wrinkle in your bedspread at age six when you can't even reach the wall to straighten out that uh, was good for a beating. Uh, every day were inspections that uh, the, the, the bad news list was read at lunch, just like Judgment Day. We would line up outside the house parents' room. They would read us our charges. We'd bend over, grab our ankles. They would take a huge truck tire tread slipper and beat on us. Straight to noon rest, you couldn't be caught with your eyes open for the next hour. Uh, but when I was nine years old and they were teaching us in math class how to average things, the most reoccurring thing in my life that I could think to average, and I kept a little, little tally secretly under my pillow, was how many times do they beat me in this place? And it was 17 times a week, sometimes to the point where you couldn't walk. So it was a, it was a frightening place to be a child. What a terrible distortion of, of the faith. You, oh. you told me that you would cry into your pillow because you couldn't be seen to cry. Couldn't get caught crying. And you were concluding that your angel might be lazy or, or something was terribly I wrong. I screamed into my pillow for mercy for years. I mean, you got to understand, this went on for years, nine months out of every year. Screamed into my pillow and thought, you know, I must have the laziest guardian angel in all of heaven. <laughs> And your sister would hear your cry. She My was sister you. had her room. We had a girls' hall and a boys' hall in a central dining room area. Uh, she was probably about 50 yards away from where I was. She knew my cry. I mean, there was a cacophony of children crying. You can imagine the crack of the whip. Uh, it, was, it was a desperate place, but she knew my cry. And when she would hear the whip crack and hear my cry, way down there, she would cry too. She's my best friend. People would say, how friends. could they get away with it? But there was a terrible manipulation going on, which, again, distorted theology. It's a wonder yeah, well, you would they, come uh, out of that with God ever in your sights. Many of my friends didn't. They used our love for God, our love for our parents, and our love for Africans to silence us against the crimes that were being brought to us. They warned us, if you try to tell your parents what happens to you here, uh, you will ruin their ministries in Africa. You will be Satan's tool to send Africans to hell. We wrote letters every week. To this day, it's hard for me to put pen to paper because I lied to my parents every week. All these, we got whole boxes at home of these bubbly, nice letters, you know, had a birthday party. Not a word about, the, about being beaten, not a word about the sexual abuse. Um, they bought our silence by our love for our parents. Three months that we were home while I was being healed by this village, uh, we still didn't tell. No, nobody told. Uh, Fifty kids. You know, child development experts now say it is amazing. A lot of research on this now. Amazing the hurt and the pain that children will absorb to protect the people that they love. And we did it. We were silent like lambs. 
there came a breaking point for you where you could be silent no longer. What led up to that? I was the one who broke the silence. Uh, one of the things they didn't allow us to have was pictures of our parents. So the first month whenever I closed my eyes, I still had a, a, an image of my parents in my mind and I would cry myself to sleep as quietly as possible. Uh, but by the ninth month, I couldn't remember what they looked like anymore. And my great fear was I'm going to break my mama's heart when I go back and I don't know which one is, is my mama. So we'd been in America for a year on furlough and not a word from my sister and I about this for 12 months. But it's time to go back to Africa and uh, they had gathered up about 20 of us missionary kids all going back by propeller airplane. But moms and dads were coming with supplies by ship. So we're in New York's airport and um, saying goodbye. I mean, the, it, it's time to board the plane. And I, I took my mother's face in my hands. I'm nine years old. And I just looked intently at her. I mean, I was innocently memorizing every line. And she finally said, what are you doing, Wes? And I said, Mommy, I just don't want to forget what you look like. Well, she burst into tears. What mom, mom wouldn't? I burst into tears, but I also seized a moment to send out a desperate SOS. And in like 30 seconds, I said, Mama, please don't send me back there. Please don't. They hate me. They beat me. Please, please, please don't send me back. Well, she had the look of horror on her face. She had never heard this. She'd been telling everybody the kids are happy. They're off to school. This look of horror on her face. But they marched me onto the plane. There was no more time for another word. My friends who had heard me in my outburst, knowing that school environment, nobody would sit with me. I was a dead man walking all the way to Africa, first to Paris, then on to Africa. My mom and dad did come by ship, and sure enough, on the 30 days that it took them to get to Africa, with no more information than that desperate plea from her son, mom had a nervous breakdown. And the minute she got to Africa, they turned around and they, they shipped her right back to the States. And word spread across the mission field like wildfire. Have you heard what's happening to the kids? We got no, nobody had any idea. And when word got up to the boarding school a, day, a week away from, uh, from our parents, uh, the, the staff I just went into a rage. And this man that uh, had been abusing me and harming me for many, many years uh, took out his revenge on me in a, in a rather twisted, rather creative way. He grabbed me and he threw me up onto a folding chair in the dining room in front of the 50 other kids. And he says, you know, you can't serve God and Satan both. Wes has tried. And sure enough, as we told you, if you tell his mother's on her way back to America, their ministry is destroyed. There will be Africans in hell because of this little boy. You can't serve God and Satan, you can, just as you can't burn a candle from both ends. And in a twisted mind, he grabbed a knife and, he, he, and he, he trimmed off the other end of a birthday candle so it could burn from both directions and lit it. And you were holding I'm holding this just like this. And I'm standing there, my knees are knocking. I'm contemplating, what is this going to mean very, very shortly here? And I figured, well, what will happen is he'll be happy. I will scream like a little baby. I will throw it down, and he will gloat yet again. And then I had a desperate thought. I could win this time. For the first time in my life, he has leveled the playing field. If I am willing to endure enough pain, I could win. This will be my little Masada. This, I don't retreat from this mountain. And it will maybe be his Waterloo. And so I determined I wasn't going to drop that. I watched as it burned closer and closer. I clenched my teeth. He turned his back to me and was telling the kids how horrible I was and all about Africans in hell. And uh, I got to the point where I couldn't even hear him anymore. All I could hear was the blood pounding in my ears. Pain. And I clenched my teeth and I clenched every muscle. And I watched these flames get closer. I said, I'm not dropping this. I'm not dropping. I watched my fingers turn red. I watched a bubble pop out. And then all of a sudden, mysteriously, I just lifted out of myself. And I was, look, I was hovering like right over here. I was looking back down on this little boy and this candle as if it was happening to someone else. When one of the kids couldn't stand it, jumped up, slapped it out of my hand. All the ki kids screamed and scattered. And there I stood, this skinny little boy with a pith helmet on, uh, on this chair. And I, in that minute, I had my calling. I went from victim to victor in my mind. Uh, I had finally taken a stand. And yes, my fingers were burned, but I knew at that point from now on, this is, this is what I do. I fight for children. I'm the one who speaks up for children, for those who can't speak for themselves. I was 10 years old by that time, and I have done really basically just that.
with all the rest of my life. I have always spoken up, always defended, always championed children. And God has entrusted to me this massive ministry to over a million children. And um, yeah, but it came from a deep valley of sorrow and poverty and uh, the overwhelming destruction of uh, abuse.